that, that the whole idea of a company and its employees and its customers is simply just a, a way of making money. I think it's a really gross attitude. Hi guys, so um, we're here with a bit of a different Jim's cast. We've actually got Instagram here as well going for anyone who's watching on the live stream and there is Jim the man over there. Stuck, stuck in a Jim's mowing stubby holder. It is, yeah. it's it's the new version of it. Yeah, it's a good phone holder. It's a stubby holder, it's a phone holder as well now. So we are live streaming um, our recording off the weekly Jim's Group podcast, which we are doing. And we don't have any news to really report for Jim's Group this week, which is sometimes no news is good news because of... um. Well, it's going good, actually. I mean, I, I don't know our training's coming back 22nd of June, which is exciting, uh, in-person training. Well, let's talk about that a bit more, actually, yeah. So let's we had the temperature check station, which people have seen, which is the thermal imaging camera. When I mean, you go up to it, it checks your temperature, yeah, so they'll be in place. Weird American voice speaking at you, telling you you've got the right temperature when you go in. Yes. So that will be um, in place at training, won't it? Yes. So when they come to the... And we'll have, when we'll have hand washing and just social distancing, the rest of it. But we reckon we, we should be able to very safely have 50 people um, well, 50 is the limit anyway. Yeah. So make sure if you are thinking about coming to train and get in now because once the 50 is done... We can't do any more. Can't do any more. Now, do you want to talk about the month afterwards because there's a bit of thing, you know, people with interstate and not coming to training, all that sort of stuff, maybe well, in July. Well, if people cannot come to in-person training, we'll continue the mobile training for sure. Yeah. But we hope to go back to in-person training. It's just a, it's a different atmosphere, as you know. It's mm. just that feeling of... Um, you know, being part of something and feeling that, that vibe, that spirit, it, it's, it's quite noticeable. And actually, you find the more people are there, the, the, the stronger the, the emotion is. I also just like to speak to franchisees. I like to meet everybody as far as I can face-to-face, have a, at least a short conversation with everybody there. Because what I've noticed is that when people have spoken to me, they're far more likely to call me back. Mm. I very rarely get people from Canada or the UK contacting me. But people from Australia who've been to this, and sometimes from New Zealand who've been to the course, you think, oh, I've got a problem, I'll contact Jim just in case, you know, mm. he's successful as they say, and, then, and, they, and they get me. And often it's very useful. So if you can come to the training, please do so. Mm. Um, I know it's tempting some days to stay, just, oh, I don't have to fly over, but trust me, it's worth it if it's, you come. It's a, it's a, look, the, the online training is working okay, but it's a, it's a whole different experience. You'll never forget it. Mm. So please do that, guys. Now let's get into today's topic, Jim. So we had a chat yesterday, and you're, you're listening to an audio book. Which you do? And Actually, you... It was, it was, it's, not, it's not my tablet, as a matter of fact. It's, it's an right. Amazon book. Yeah. Oh, it's a book. Okay, you're reading a book so online. I can't remember the title. Right. something to do with Lab Rats, but it's talking about business culture and about this thing that's been going on ever since the 1970s, since uh, Milton Friedman, that says the only stakeholders that matter in, the, in a business is the shareholders, which, of course, for Jim's is, Jim is me, of course. And, and People are coming up recently and saying things like, well, no, that's not a very good way to run a business. And there's, there's other stakeholders that should be considered, like the employees, the customers, obviously in our cases, our franchisees. And they just really rung a bell with me. I just think morally it's correct. The kind of stuff that goes on in a lot of these American companies is terrible. Like they have a practice of every year they, 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 they can the, the bottom 10% of performers, which is, which is appalling. I mean, regardless of how good or they are in absolute sense, whether they're trying them, they just get rid of them, and then they put they put more in, and they just people work incredibly ridiculous hours, and, and just uses people out, and spits them out, and I, and I hate that kind of culture. I also think that even though some of these tech giants have done fairly well in recent, you know, companies like Uber and so forth, mind you, Uber's not even making a profit. Long term, great companies do think about more than profits. I think it's it, I think it's a corrosive attitude and it's something that I would we really I mean not that I, I react against it but it's one of the things that I, I very strongly feel about in gyms is that we we are here for the benefit of everybody and that's not just franchisees as I talk about but also staff as well mm. and I take great pride in the fact that until quite recently we had three people working in gyms who'd been around like 25 years ago and we were in a single you know small office and and a couple of them actually resigned since then one's still with us but to me, that's good. And, and, and to me, turnover of staff is a sign of failure. Do you think, so in America, do you think that that ruthlessness in the corporation, corporate culture is why their economy has been, is the world's greatest economy? I think, it, I think in the short term, it may actually have some benefits, but long-term great companies, um, Hewlett Packard's a, a, a great example of that, of, of a company that really looks after people fairly well. Um, and, and builds relationships and builds culture. There's, there's a series of books, um, Jim, um, James Collins, Good to Great, Built to Last, yep. 
talking about the long-term great companies. And these, these tech giants are fairly new, like Amazon is another example, an incredibly exploitative company at every level. Absolutely. Well, South Park, I don't know if you know South Park, Jim, but South Park's a satirical program in America, which is um, quite funny. It's an adult cartoon, and they did a whole episode on Amazon. It was, it was, quite, it was quite funny. Well, look, it's, it's awful. I, mean, I must say, yeah, I use Amazon all the time. I, yeah. I, I buy my books from Amazon, and I, I get my audio books, and, and there's really nothing else around it. But the way they treat people in the warehouses and the sweatshop conditions and the base wages and, and, and the... Uh, you know, white collar head head office workers are, are treated no better too. They're just incredibly miserly, short term thinking. And I think in I think in the long term, however much money these people make in the short term, it's just not a good, just not a good thing. Now, what what do you try and do differently then? Do you do you, is there something you actively try and do, or you just naturally gravitated towards it, or do you step outside the business sometimes and think about what can I do? Well, I've always had from better. the beginning of gyms that my franchisees were my top priority. And that's something that I think, when you have a look at, at companies like, um, and Retail Food Group is the perfect example of this, this attitude, the, the, this exploitative attitude. Basically, they went and they bought a whole lot of established uh, franchises like Brumbies and so forth that had been built yep. up by somebody else. And they just screwed them for the last dollar. Mm. And in the short term, that was pretty good for their share price, I presume. But in the end, it just destroyed them. And, and these companies have gone down and you've got massive bad publicity and inquiries and everything else. And, and, you know, they're down to a fraction of the value they were. It, it's just very short-term thinking. In gyms, we just, right from the beginning, I had this attitude, no matter what it was, I wasn't going to do anything that would impact on my franchisees. The choices that you make, like, for example, who do you choose? One of the things we push right from the beginning is that you've got to be selective. And if somebody's not likely, if somebody's likely to fail, you've got to say no to them because it's immoral to say yes. And I always did that as an ethical decision, but looking back, it's actually one of the most profound, good business decisions I've ever made to actually choose good people because people who fail are very bad for you in all kinds of ways. They, they put off, well, they go, they go out there and tell them that gyms is a terrible idea. And it still does happen, of course, but we, not any more than I can help it. But people who fail, they say gyms is a terrible idea, don't do it, and they tell everybody they know not mm. to do it potential for bad publicity, for example. They upset people who are in the system already and they drag them down and so forth and they take a lot of trouble and they upset franchisors because you, people you can't help. So it's a really, really bad idea, even though in the short term, putting on everybody would seem to be a great idea. We just don't do that. Mm. And what do you think about the recent thing in Green Acres in NZ that we heard about the other day with the um, them still charging fees during the lockdown? Yeah, that's right. This, this is a franchisee who's made no money, who cannot work at all by law. Now, when we were told about this, we said, that's okay, we'll just... We'll just um, suspend everyone. Suspend yeah, everybody. Yeah. We spend the franchisees' fees, we spend the franchisors' fees. Of course you do that. Not even, nobody in gyms would even dream of saying something different. And we just discovered that Greenacres say, no, keep on paying us fees. You've got no income. Mm. How, how is that fair? And it's not only immoral, but it's also incredibly profoundly stupid because of course it got into the media. What are people are going to think about a company like that? I know, and the, and the silly thing for them is once they, once a media outlet picks it up, they're all syndicated, right? So it goes yeah. from here, goes bang, 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 bang. So when you type in Green Acres now into Google, most likely that article for the next 10 years or five years is going to come up in the first couple of search results. Yeah. So the same thing happened very, in very early days when we were up against VIP, which is our major competitor. I'm not, like, I know one not VIP. I think they're credible company in many ways but one of their policies they don't let people go and they had six franchisees in the old days who wanted to go independent and they went to court and they lost the court they had you know massively difficult court case and then it went on the investigators all over the country they never recovered from that mm. so and we have a yeah and, and so that that sort of fight to the last kind of policy was just it's just foolish you're looking at short-term income and you're not thinking of the long-term consequences. So I'll take it back to what you said about the, the American stuff you've been reading. Like, now let's just, so I think it's 10 days holidays, that's it in America. Um, do you think that in a way has contributed to a lot of the, um, obviously the economic prosperity, but obviously you can see the breakdown at the moment. We won't go into it too much, but there's a lot of breakdown. Do you think that sort of working conditions, that's created that massive divide? Because there's a lot of poverty in America as well. There's a heap of people... In, in poverty there, yeah, people right? are working at McDonald's warehouses are on food stamps because yeah. they're so poor. It's 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 a, it's a terrible system. I mean, in a sense, you don't want to price people out of the out of jobs, but the, the, the pitiful low wages they pay over there are just appalling for the kind of conditions they work under. I just 
I would just hate to see that happening in this country. Well, it's interesting. What, what do you think of tipping culture then? Because I know when, I, when I've been there once before, I can't understand tipping. If you're a business, you should pay your staff enough so they don't have to live off tips. What do you think about that whole tipping culture in America, for example? Yeah, well... <laughs> do you understand? I don't understand it. I, I think if you're a business owner, you should pay them and why are they living off tips? I think it's ridiculous, but... Yeah, I'm, I must say I don't. I don't tip. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lousy. I'm a lousy mm. restaurant payment. I don't. I don't tip. I think people get paid well. If I've got extra money, then I'd rather put it into something like scientific research or some sort of a, a charity or some of that nature where you can where you can define do good. Well, what do you think about the modern CEO then? So basically, when when you're reading that book, you obviously have their their main thing is to drive as much make as much money, much revenue as possible to return if they're a public company to that or for whoever themselves are, and then screw everyone else is basically. Mm-hmm. The sentiment, and what you found interesting, you said that they don't value the customer, as a st- don't consider the customer as a stakeholder. No, they don't. They don't. Which is interesting, because for me, we we, we obviously been taught the customer is the number one thing, right? So, after, after a franchise. After the franchisees, but I'm just saying the general business sense would be your customer. Mm-hmm. You know, is always what customers are priority, etc. They, they do. They do look after customers, but it's always from the point of view of is this good for our bottom line? Whereas to me, looking after a customer goes beyond that. It's it's a moral obligation. And even if I knew that we would never ha- suffer any harm from a customer not being looked after, I'd still want to look after the customer because it's the right thing to do. So it's a, it's a different moral attitude. It's not that I don't care about customers. That they, they Obviously, they do everything they can to try and get the customer to come back and spend money. But customers don't have a value in their own sake mm. as, as individuals. And sometimes you hear of things that... You know, that go wrong, and, and and you know there's no there's no real good business case for it, but it's just the right thing to do. Yeah, I completely agree. Now, what do you think about the, the actual? Was there much art stuff written on the, about them as CEOs themselves, like the CEO mentality or their attitude, or? Yeah, just just very ruthless and exploitative. Yeah. It's just looking at the these people are making this amount incredible amount of money. I think one of the things I find offensive too personally is is that so much of this is based on they they put this vast investment into an idea and the whole idea is to build it up to something and then flip it yeah that 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 the whole idea of a company and its employees and its customers is simply just a a way of making money i think it's a really gross attitude i mean i i i love gyms i've been what it's now um 30 years 31 years Mm -hmm. actually this month since i started the franchise and and i don't intend to do anything different for the rest of my life I, I love this company. I, I, I have an obligation to my franchisees. I, I feel a sense of a pride of involvement. I have a meaning for getting up in the morning. It's not just about money. And mm. there's a lot of ways that I could have, you could use this for make a whole lot more money than we actually do. But it's, it's, it's far more than that. And yeah, that's a common... It's, it's a family. It's a, it's a community. It's a tribe. I, I love that, that, that concept. Well, it's definitely a tribe with the divisions. You see when they come to training, you can def- definitely see the ones who, depending if they're cleaning, dog wash or mowing, they have a little tribe and the way they go. But I was going to say, it's quite interesting in what you said there about that. So is that... Is, you've, you've always set out that mentality, right? It was never... You never... Because you never intended to purely make this into a money-making venture. It's sort mm. of an accidental story in a way. So what, what do you think um, moving forward that you would like to see companies sort of change their mindset to. I'll give you an example. Let's say ones like KPMG or these big ones, which are the massive firms where they're just there, you know, flogging people for their intellectual resources. And law firms, for example, is another good one. Yeah, how I, do you think they should change businesses in the future? How do you think they should lead differently? I think if people start acting ethically and properly, short term, they'll suffer a bit of a hit. Long term, it'll be good. That's one thing that I'd love to do is Jim's legal because I know there's a, from, from wide experience after 30 years of business, there is, there is a huge difference between law firms. You have law firms that act decently and ethically in the interest of the customer, and others just screw people in a way that I find unbelievable. They, they, they take money from a client knowing, must, they must know that there's no possible way that this person can even get that much money back. I've mm. had some of these cases. It's just awful what they do. And I reckon having a, a if you could have a system of feedback so that lawyers who did the right thing were, were rewarded better than they are, then, then it's it would be very it's positive. It's a cloak and dagger profession, really. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. You're right. You'd think there'd be a lot more online about them and, mm. and things like that, but it's really hidden. There's a lot of cynicism about lawyers, yeah. and sometimes it's justified, but sometimes it isn't. Some of the most decent people I know are actually lawyers. Mm. Um, really good, honourable, human, ethical human beings. Uh, I had a family law case 20 years ago, and my, my family court lawyer was a lovely, lovely lady. She She would... She would lie awake at night worrying about the case, and she just did everything she could to help. She was a fantastic human being, and mm. 
And some lawyers are absolute scumbags. I can't <laughs> comprehend how badly they, they treat people and how they wreck people's lives. Yeah, but in the, the day, they've got to live with themselves, though, Jim, don't they? They have to go in bed knowing it. And at the end of their lives, for example, I don't think they're going to look back too kindly on what they've done. So you know, that's how I look at things with that sort of... Karma always gets people in the end, Jim. So if you be a bad person doing that, it always catches up with you in some way. Yeah. Well, I think, I think ill-gotten wealth doesn't do people any good. I think, I think earning, earning money in the wrong way will, will string back somehow, either on your own life or on what it does to your kids or whatever. There's lots of miserable rich people, Jim. <laughs> There's lots of miserable rich people. There you certainly know. are. And Absolutely. the people that are rich, that are happy, tend to be the ones that have actually made their money in a way that means something. And you read about some of these people like... Um, uh, sort of Hewlett Packard, yeah, yeah, a good, good example. Mm-hmm. The people who actually believe in what they do and they, and they live for it and... and I, they get satisfaction out of out of their business, and then all this, obviously you've got people like Bill Gates that I've heard to report who actually use their money in a way that's helpful to other people. I think these are people are more, most likely going to make some achieve happiness in life. Mm. So a vast amount of money without happiness and without real benefit to your children in terms of the kind of people they turn out to be. What's the point of it? What's the value? What's the value just being rich for its own sake? Yeah, I've come across a lot of people like that, and their kids are a reflection of. Of their upbringing, and they're not. Some of them are not very nice. Some of them turn out really, really well. It's just, it's just one of those things. But um, you're right. Money people people use money to compensate for a lot of things, and they go and buy a lot of things to make themselves feel better, and all this sort of stuff. And you know, it's good to have a nice car, or whatever. And but you know, mm. is that really what you're missing? Is that really what you want in life? Sometimes you know, deal with that inner stuff first before you got to look after everybody. Things. I mean, we we have a big thing at, at gyms, as you know. We we um, like we've just ordered a. a, a, a Bucket, uh, the, box of uh, home fresh, yeah. Box of home fresh. Yeah, it was good. Fruit. I love it. We, we we do things for staff. We have the staff lunch, which we just started to get on the Thursday. We we trying desperately to get our health club, which is which is to a large extent to do with with staff benefits. And I want staff to want to come to work here. I want them to enjoy working here. I don't want them. No, I don't want people to leave. I hate losing good people. It really really upsets me when I lose a good person. And what do we do wrong? How how why couldn't we hold that person? It's definitely been a lot, um, a lot. Uh, it's a really good. I love it as a place to work now. It's been really good. But the fruit thing's quite funny. Absolutely, the fruit thing's great. You know, we've got a couple of people in the office who buy junk food every day. So you're doing yourself. You know, you think yourself. You're doing a benefit to the healthcare system. You're trying to reduce the the healthcare bill. You know, because you know there's junk food around all the time. So having the box of fruit there, which we do. I it, does, it does actually reduce the junk food. You can actually visibly see it on the desks how there's less of that stuff lying around. Like getting sick of me, I'm always lecturing him in there. You know, they're always going, I need to do something about my health and fitness. And they go down and get hungry. Jack's like, what are you doing? Weak minded, you know, same thing. So now they've got the fruit there. Give them the fruit, give them a bit of a clap. Positive reinforcement. I think the other thing that's important too, which is which is something that was more around in the old days, but been lost recently, is the idea that people can start anywhere and go anywhere. I have a big thing about promotion. And it's one of the things his book was on about too. There's, there's this rigid caste distinction. You go in as a base level worker. Yeah, yeah. You're always going to work in a workhouse and you're going to flip hamburgers or whatever. You, you'll, never, you'll never get beyond that. Mm. And then you have the executive thing, people who've got tertiary degrees and stuff. And as you know, we have a very strong policy because I talk to pretty well every staff member regularly. And so if I see somebody who's got some abilities like yourself, who's actually come from a base double job to one of the Got a top, few, few abilities, top yeah. managers. Also, <laughs> Megan in Jim's Plus. Yeah. And she's a really, really amazing manager, even though you wouldn't think so. And she never worked in anything but a base double position. But in here, she can be have her ideas listened to and she can talk and, and, and have the opportunity to flourish. Well, Jean, Jenny's the one for me, Jenny in the sales team. So when I when I hired her or when we when I said put her into the sales role it was basically she worked in the, the call center for 10 years right yeah. now the call center is great culture great, but it's not an easy job sometimes and to do that for 10 years means you're consistent you're disciplined you know and she's a single mother as well so you know she's got a we've had time some management skills. great people come out of the call center yeah but but the thing is with her is that once you say to him you can do probably more than what you think you can do and you and you give him a bit of you know and say run with it absolutely run with it yeah, yeah. Ginny's, Ginny's wonderful. She's really, really great. She's mm. just a terrific worker, terrific human being. And, and there's, there's gold. There's a lot of people who just don't get the opportunity to develop in life. True. And that, but, that's, but that's also because no one goes out of their way to help them, though. I'm not saying you need that. But like with Jenny, for example, I knew she could do it. So I encouraged her to do it. And I said, yes, I'll back her in and she's going to do it. And now I'm really happy because that's what, you know, she, her life's a lot better now. She's making a lot more money than what she did previously. 
and she's doing really well. But the thing is, some t- you're right, some people just sit there and expect it to happen. Sometimes it's not going to happen. You have to take ownership sometimes and make Look, it happen yourself. Most, most people who work in base level jobs probably don't have the interest or the aptitude or combination of both to really go beyond that. But there are some great people who just don't get an opportunity. True. I remember when I first um, offered um, Megan a, a pay rise and she, she was very moved. She'd never actually been offered it. And she's such an incredible person. Hmm. But that's also sometimes a confidence as a person. But that's why I love the gym's franchising model as well sometimes, as you said. Some people might be stuck. Well, this is not a sales pitch, but some people might be stuck, as you said, doing the minimum wage or doing this thing, you've got no other option. It's such a great option for them to make. Hmm. Like Dan, Dan's a great one. The 26-year-old bloke, Dan Cale, is in his second year turning over lots of money. I won't say because I'll get in trouble, but he's turning over a lot of money, right? So 26-year-old, he's come from McDonald's being a manager there. Into this, after two years, he's turning over a lot of money. You know, who would have thought that? You know, and he's doing, and he'd be doing far better than a 26 year old his age working as a second year lawyer in a firm or whatever else it is, you know, and he's doing yeah. far better than him. He's way more happy. Well, most, most people who do law degrees don't actually act as lawyers. So there's been yeah, years, me years one here. at university. That's me. I've got mine. <laughs> and, and, they, and they don't get it. And I yeah. think the, the, the opportunity for people to, who don't necessarily have a tertiary education, and they might even be minded towards it, not everybody is suited to, to working as a, a, you know, doing a student. Yeah, that's all we focus on, but there's so many opportunities out there. And I think within, the, within our company, but also more particularly within for our franchisees, it's an opportunity for somebody who has that drive and that ability not to be held back and say, oh, you haven't got a degree, you're worthless. Mm, so I can actually really, say, yeah, yeah. Hey, you want to become a millionaire? You want to make you know, half a million dollars a year? Sure, this is how you can do it. What I love is seeing the confidence in people. You know, you've seen some, I've seen some people who come to training and you think they're a bit, let's say, mousy or not that confident. You think, oh, how's this person going to go? Then you hear a year later or two years later they're flying, you know, and that's what I love about it. You see their confidence as people build by being a business owner, getting out of their comfort zone, you know, doing these things which they're not. That's just personal growth all around, right? Yep, and that's Look, great. It's not everybody. Some people come in who, who fail. You know, there's a few percent who actually do fail, and, and whatever we can do, and that does happen. That's distressing. Majority do pretty well. They make decent living, probably at least equivalent to what they're making in the past. And there's a few that can do absolutely brilliantly. But, but if they weren't for the situation, I mean, so many people tell me, I just wish I'd done this 10 years ago. Because yeah, they've yeah. seen, they, they've seen a, a career that could sort of take off. It's not a sales pitch. We always hear it. And it's sort of, it's sort of funny. It's not, it's not funny, but they, they go harder and harder and harder, though, don't they? So let's say they start at 40. They're, geez, I've got to make up for all these lost years. And they just go smash it. One of my favorite years, jobs is on business. Monday night. I actually ring up my, my veterans who've reached significant anniversaries, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, and, and just talk to them. And it's really just a very uplifting experience to hear some of the stories how it's changed their life i i really i really love that i wish i wish it was the case of everybody we'd love to have everybody for 20 years for sure but uh, mm. yeah we'd love to hear more positive stuff you know we get a lot a lot of negative stuff being in our positions in hq that's a way more negative than positive so if anyone's listening or watching you've got something positive to say please send it through but best set through an interesting article today in the uk and it has some australian statistics and they said the average age of a new entre- entrepreneur was 40 years old yeah. which, which i found interesting 40 years old, people think you have to be younger or my chances have sailed, have, have sailed by. Whereas that's actually not the case at all. It was, I think, 40 years old was the, the, the ideal age or the age that people were starting businesses, which yeah. I thought was very interesting. There, there, is, there is this prejudice against people of a certain age. I know when people are getting over 40, and especially over 50, it's very, very difficult. And one of the things in our office too. We've got a couple of older people. We've got a lot more older. Do you think we have more old, old people than younger people in the office? I'd say we've got a lot more. I'd say more older than, than younger. I think of people like Archie and Bev who are Yeah, Archie's a dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So we just don't care. I mean, we just don't care about age. I just don't care about age or, or gender or race or mm. sexual orientation or anything. I just don't care. Bring a person in, if they can do the job, what does it matter? Some people might might be, you know, over the hill at forty five and some people might be going strong in their sixties. I mean <laughs> Everyone's different, you know, that's the main thing, right. right? Everyone's different. Everyone wants to put a box or label on something you like once you're past fifty you're done. And um, I remember my, my old man growing up, you know, he was a robotics design engineer. This was back in the, the early 90s, like really new field. And, you know, it's like over the hill, you know, 50 years old, you're over the field. It's like, no, you're not. You know, but it's, it's just one of those things, right? So people like to put those box and labels. And I think we're better for it, the experience. And then you have some youth in there as well. We have a lot of diversity in the IT team as well. There's a lot of diversity in there. It's all over. We're just, we're just, we're just blind to it. If you look at there's there's no real pattern. No. I mean, I mean, I mean we, we tend to have a probably more women in management in gyms than anywhere else, but there's no decision. I never set that to say, oh, we need more women in that position. Yeah, and that's an interesting one. What do you think about the whole quotas? Because companies do have quotas. They have quotas for certain 
races, uh, ethnicities, and they have quotas for, for men and women, like with boards, for example. You've got to have something amount of percentage on a board. What do you think about that sort of stuff? Yeah, I think it's a terrible idea. I mean, I mean, sometimes you might have to overcompensate because your culture is against a certain gender or race or something like that. But I just, where we are, it just, it just never comes up. I mean, I mean, we, we tend to have a lot of women because we tend to employ a lot of women in various roles. And, and you know, like a finance is run by a woman, um, Jim's Plus by a woman. The, the call centre by Jill, I mean, she doesn't work for me directly anymore, but, but you know, you just got a lot of really, really great people at every level. Mm. So, you know, the best person for the job. Mm. I, I, find it, I find it quite offensive to give a person a job because of their gender. But whether you employ them because they're a male or because they're a female, I, I just hate that idea. People should be get a job based on how good they are at doing it, on how much they put into it, whether they care about what they do. It's an interesting one. And big companies, they definitely go out of the way to do it. I remember I dated this HR manager from V-Line. And V-Line's obviously, they were doing more train drivers. You know, they specifically went out, we need more women or we need more of this, as opposed to getting the best person for the job. And I thought it was quite interesting. Mm. You're hearing how they had to go and they were mandated to go and get this sort of person for these, fill these roles. Whereas this whole thing's being you know, discriminated against. Based on this quote. Maybe, maybe they need to for large companies, but I think that's a, it's a pity. I think the best thing. One of the things I'm always really strong about is, is trying to get to know people as much as possible. Know my staff. Now, that's easy enough. I've only got about 50 people working here, so it's not huge, but try and know my staff. And also, you know your franchisees and know what they think. This whole communication thing is so important. Well, the communication is very easy to get to you, isn't it? It's very easy, open lines. Yeah. Mm. People find that very surprising, how it is that you can have you know, nearly 4,000 franchisees and, and all my staff and every single one of them has direct access and people think, oh, you're going to get flooded, but you're not. It's actually very useful. You know, you, you, can, you can hear things and quite often there's nothing to it, but, but then you, you get a, an idea of what people are saying and we change all the time based on feedback. Mm. There really would hardly be a week goes by that we don't change something based on feedback from somebody. Some people have fantastic ideas. You know, a franchisee or a junior staff member, anybody... Not necessarily part of the management team, but they have they, they, they're close to the ground. What do you think about businesses having to develop more of an emotional intelligence over IQ yes. moving forward? What do you think I, about that? I think IQ is grossly overestimated. Mm. I, I, I tell my kids all the time, um, I, 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 I don't really care how bright a person is, but what I care about <laughs> is the, are, they, are they somebody who cares about what they do? If you've got your heart in your job, and you're thinking about your job and how you can do it better, whether you're a franchisee or a staff member or whatever, that's what you want. And somebody looks at a certain level of humility to say, okay, what can I do better? How can I change? That, that kind of attitude is what counts, not, not intellectual well do, you, well, do you think this, this, this crisis has forced businesses or forced, let's say, some old, let's say CEOs who might have been in their old ways not, you know, to change their sort of mentality now? Because I've had to. Let's have more flexible work arrangements is a perfect example, right? I'd like this, to think so. This whole thing where we have to drive to this point, gather in a herd, herd, herd of a spot, and then go back home, whereas we could have done the whole work from back home, the well, whole mentality. Yeah. Well, it's, it's changing us too, of, of course. We've just found that our IT staff in particular work very, very well from home. So come in a couple of days a week and the rest from home. Yeah, they don't want to be around each other. They don't want to be around people. No, because they're, <laughs> they're just nerds. They sit there in that room with the blinds drawn and they, and they, they code all day. They That's don't it. really need... Yeah. You, you do need some sort of contact because because I find I find actually I do like to talk to people but in person there's no substitute Zoom is not a substitute phones aren't a substitute emails you've got to talk and you know I want to come down to the office in the evening yeah, it's every day yeah, yeah. And, and we just it's important and sometimes we do, we just yeah. sit around and chat for half an hour and often the best ideas come out of that 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 casual conversation well it's our form of a management meeting i guess but that's what happens every day isn't it it's more yeah. of a yeah. we have very few full management meetings there's the none there's none and that, but that's what i would call the formal management meeting is that sort of time at night that's what i reckon yeah just yeah. just 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 chatting about what's going on what's happening and, and discuss this and discuss that and come up with this idea and then yeah, I, I find those very constructive and also we've had a situation to people like Haydar coming in too to help mm. with looking at attrition you know why the franchises leave and what can we do about it then talk to some of the franchisors like um, Matt Kavanagh is another example too who's got or Paul King who's got great results yeah, a lot of what, good what, ideas, what yeah. are you doing different and, and, and bringing these guys in and saying okay what are you doing and what can we do for you how can we change how can we make it better yeah, and yeah, and the thing is, we're getting lots of great ideas, and we've got to take and try and do some of those things and knock them off, which is what we're we're actually working on, which is great. One of the ones was the three the three year training, 
yes. think, was an idea, which was one of the done from Paul King and from other franchisors as well. I think, it was, I think it was other everyone's ideas in my own group, but that was a good one. We started talking about that about uh, a couple of weeks back. Yeah. I don't know where it's coming to at the moment. But I think they had to have another meeting around it, but it, it's a great idea. It's just a matter of putting in the actual, doing, executing it. You know, you've got to put all the, the schedules and this, together. This, and this is the stuff. idea that we bring people back who've been two or three years in the business and say, okay, here's a course fully paid for, which is we've got to work out how to pay for it exactly, yep. but we've got some sponsorship money and so forth. Come back and just spend some time with us and learn about, from the really successful people, how you can put on workers and do yep. splits. and and How to scale your business is probably the, yeah. Get your business up. So, yeah, yeah. you know, give you something to work for because we don't want you to get tired of being here and saying, I'm doing the same thing. Let, let, let's Because what's fun about business is, is change. I mean, I, I mowed lawns 15 years and it was good. I liked it. But I have to be honest, at the age of 68, I probably still wouldn't be making a living mowing lawns because it would be too much the same thing. Mm. But what I've done is I've changed my business. So every year that goes by, it changes. Yep. Even this last year has been very, very different because of the development of the IT side of the business too, which has been quite extraordinary and the potential. It's, it's exciting. It's interesting. It's always good to change. I was going to say also with the um, people working from home, which is obviously something that now you've had to do, and but it's been fine, hasn't it? It's a lot less, lot less cars in the car park. It's good, and it's a bit more, a bit more done in the office, which is good. Well, no sometimes people need to come in a bit. Yeah, <laughs> I sent an email to Gadra, and I said, I want to see you every now and then. <laughs> it's good to, yeah. it's just good to talk about things, and you, you can't. Yeah. I know what you mean. But generally speaking, working from home works very, very well. I know yeah. the call center is working brilliantly, and then there's nobody there. I think they'll. I think they might change that though later on. We'll see how they go when it's when it's they can. Uh, Jill but, says they do want to come back. They, yeah. they they miss their social life. But I mean, that may be for some of them. Most of them, most of the time, I don't know. But I'll say to some of our staff, if like especially the the, the ladies with young children, like it's been great for them. Well, maybe not for them, depending on which way you look at it. But maybe they could do two days, you know, two days in, then three days at home with their kids and, and do that sort of stuff. That flexibility, I think, is going to be really good. And yeah. that might keep a lot more people in the workforce if they have that flexibility as well. Yeah, I think people who've got kids, it's especially especially people with young children, the ability to be able to work and be at home and have a very flexible hours actually works quite well. As long as as long as it's clear they're working hard and doing everything they should, well, it's terrific because you can avoid all that commuting time. And commuting is something that's that's horrible. I mean, I, I hate commuting. That's why I live walking distance from my office. It's mm. a very big thing for me. So I, I appreciate somebody doesn't want to travel an hour to get to work. In fact, they reckon an hour's commute both ways is equivalent to $75,000 loss of salary. Mm. So somebody on $150,000 a year commuting an hour to work is, is at the same level of happiness as somebody on 75000 which is really incredible when you think about mm. it. But that's what difference it makes. And, and I know one of the things that attracts people about franchising is, is probably the single most important thing I get, especially from men, is that since I've been a franchisee, I get to see my kids. I don't have this commute. I work from home. I've got flexible hours. Yes, I might I might be working on Saturday sometimes, but I normally wouldn't. But I can take my kid to, you know, watch their football game or this kind of thing. Yeah, it's a good interesting point you make there, Jim. I know we talk about lifestyle all the time. But I want to go in a little bit more detail about that. Is because what's the point of having a family if you can't be there with them? Mm. You, you you go to this place, you earn money to compensate for yourself as not being there as a parent, and you might you know buy them gifts or whatever you think that's parenting, but it's not. You need to be there. With your child, right? That's, a, that's Money an is a thing. very poor substitute for attention and time. Mm. It, it really is. Our kids need us. And I think it's one of the great things that I've had. I mean, I lost my earlier kids because of divorce and so forth, or at least most of the time. And that was awful. But having my four youngest actually being at home through their whole childhood has been absolutely fantastic. I, I love it. And the influence on them is quite extreme. They are really, really good kids. And it's, I think, partly, with all due modesty, it's the fact that we've always got time for them. Lee and I both got very flexible lives, and we and we, and, you know, I, I I drive my my kids to school, I pick them up, and 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 you get the chance to talk to them, and all these kinds of things. Hmm. And nothing can substitute for that, you know. And that's the, that's what that's the point I make again is that you have people who might might earn three hundred grand in, in a job in a city, but they're working all hours, and they might see their kid once on a hmm. Sunday. And for the other six days, it's set, you know. And what, and what's, well, the, what's the point uh, of having a family if that's the case? Well, what's the point of having? Yeah. What's the point of anything? I mean, I mean, you're working for for money, so you're going to have a, a fancier car, mm. a house with a whole lot of extra bedrooms, which you hardly spend much time in. I mean, what is the value of it? You know, you're some prestigious overseas holiday. It's for ego. It's all for ego and a lack of self-esteem, in my opinion. You know, that's why they have to do those things to make themselves feel better, when in, in the essence not, they don't. It's not happiness. Mm. And, 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 and scientific studies show that it doesn't actually make you happy. Times what? relationships make you happy, doing something worthwhile with your time. And if you earn money, doing something worthwhile with your money, giving it away is the best thing you can do to achieve happiness. Well, That's what. 
Yeah, but what, what do you think about regional areas? Because there's been a lot of talk about regional areas have seen a lot of an uptake in terms of property. That's sort of like, let's say, places like Warrnambool, Ballarat and Geelong because... You love Warrnambool, don't you? I do love Warrnambool. But um, I always get Warrnambool in as a mention if I don't. But, but like, but people, they're actually saying their property markets are booming at the moment still because people are being allowed to work remotely now. So they might buy a house in a Geelong or an affordable area like Ballarat or let's say Bendigo or wherever and they can... They've got a job in Melbourne still, but they're they're working in they're living in these regional areas. They're putting spending the money I, in that. I economy. think it's immensely healthy. I I really think that psychologically speaking, a, a regional town is 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 probably the best place to live. There are look, I, farming is is a great lifestyle too. I worked on a farm for a few months. It's a tough lifestyle though. Got a lot of family who's dairy farmers. It's got, it's got yeah. issues of isolation and stuff. But carving season's not good. You're up all now of the night. Or if you're in a very, very small town, there can be a very limited opportunities for you and for your kids. But you get into a regional centre like, um, you know, Bendigo, Ballarat, yeah, Warrnambool, Shaw, Tuck- yeah. Chuka, uh, Wagga, those kind yeah, of yeah. places. Yeah, Arbury, Wodonga, that, so yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of places that are really great places to live in. You have a sense of community. I know my um, my son, um, James, who actually did part of his um, law studies down in Warrnambool. At Deakin, yeah. It. I did it there And then well. when he got a job, he went out and started working in Shepparton. Yep. And he just says the the atmosphere is different. The, the people are different, and, and I think country people a, are different to city city people. So definitely, yeah. definitely true. I, I probably, in a lot of ways, would do better in in a regional centre myself. But, but I mean, you, you're tied to the city by the business and by the fact that my kids are around and all kinds of. But things. you sort of got like a regional sort of area where you are here. Well, we're in the outer way. suburbs. Yeah. we're almost as far out. You you can you drive you know ten minutes from our house and you're in the countryside. So it's kind of. It's it's as far out of the city you can be while still. While but, still but you've living. got a lot of like you've got a lot of greenery around. You've got a lot of space at your property. That's what I'm saying. You're sort of in a way. Oh yeah, you can take a walk around through yeah. the farms and so forth around here. Mind you, that's to do with by the idiotic zoning regulations. <laughs> I won't go into that, which I don't agree with. I think yeah. people should be able to live. But do you affordably. think? But it could be interesting because it could be. Let's say the positive out of the situation is that workplaces are forced to allow people to work remotely, mm-hmm. and they these people could go. Let's say live in live in Geelong. And not be scared of getting fired or whatever they they can, and because everyone else is, and they can invest that, spend that money in that economy, in that local regional economy, but still have the money, you know, have the business in uh, in Melbourne. We do need. I like the idea of having having people coming into the country like immigrants and saying, okay, but you you can come into the country provided you go and live in a in, a, in an area. They do that. They do. Yeah, yeah they absolutely. No, no, do it's, that. A, it's a great yeah, yeah. it's a great policy. Yeah. Um, I think government has surprisingly good. Number of good policies at times, and our immigration system is actually one of the best in the world. True, could still be better. True, could still be better, but uh, it's uh, that's one aspect. And I know that you've had you know populations in certain areas that go and live in in, in country towns, and it really boosts the economy, and they become very people love them, and they and they and they and they integrate incredibly well. Yeah, I look up in um, like there's a lot of like in Shepparton, there's a lot of Italian community in Shepparton. And there's all the soccer clubs and all that is sort of integrated, the businesses there, you know. I know where I'm from, there's a fruit shop called Materia Brothers, right? It's been around for for decades, you know, Italian family who immigrated and, and they're a part of the fabric of the community now and that's and that's the way it should be. And I think now, I'm, I'm just loving it because it's forced employees because before this whole crisis went down, you'd always see, oh, we need new roads in Melbourne. And so I sort of, oh, I always said, if bloody employees, you don't need this city block. There's no need for it. You can have a staff member work from home. You can monitor it effectively with all the technology in place. There's no need for someone to go to a big city block and heard with other people. There's no need for it. You know, mm-hmm. there, there is something for face to face. Maybe come in once a week, then that's fine. But does that mean you have to have a whole city block full of people working? No. And that's just force their hand at the moment. So I'm loving it. One of the things I've always dreamed about that probably never happened is to have a have an office in a place where you could actually have as many staff members as possible living within walking distance. And so it's yes. like a community as well. Yep. So wives and children and you have a common you know, if we could buy up a box around here and have a whole lot of staff members move in and I'll could, do it. And the family could use the um, the, the, the the swing pool and everything else mm-hmm. too, so they, they get to know each other. And they it, it, community is important. Actually, I was reading another book about um, somebody who grew up in in Doveton um, in the nineteen seventies and talking about the the old industrial estates and the, and the and the the car manufacturers and Heinz and people like that and and how you know they, there was a sense of community and, and people built their lives around those companies and they had very secure employment and, and talking about the loss of Australian manufacturing, which I think is, is very sad. That's a very interesting point. And a good example I'll use is in Richmond, around Victoria Street, there's the CU Carlton United Breweries there and there used to be a lot of factories there, right? And you have all those family homes and you're right, a lot of uh, people, let's say, it's a bit of an easy area predominantly now, but back in the day, there's a lot of Greeks, a lot of Yugoslavians or Croatian Serbians and that. And you're right, they had that whole that whole community that I used to form around it and they go to the factory and come back home 
all that sort of stuff. And it's also jobs for people who aren't necessarily good at the at the white collar studying the tertiary education and stuff. But it's people who really suit well in that environment, and we ought to have jobs for them. I think it's look, it's great to have cheap stuff and be able to buy. You know, it's back on the consumer though, Jim. We want cheaper things, and you know that's the thing. It's back on us. But I think I think I think we've gone too far. My my yeah. personal view is I'd be very happy to see us making a lot more in Australia. I think I think for, for safety, for security, but also for certain kinds of jobs that we. We ought to be making more stuff, and if we had to, and and that would mean we're paying a bit more for certain things. Well, well, so we should. Mm. I, I don't think it necessarily hurt if, if people keep on hang on to their old car for a bit longer rather than buying some snazzy, you know, prestigious new one. I just don't think it would hurt us that much, or maybe have a bit less to money to go overseas trips and and you know burning up the ozone layer and pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, well, why not stay home? Maybe you spend a bit more on some of your basic stuff so you can't do that kind of stuff. Yeah, so they can much. fake all those Instagram shots at home when they're on holiday. They can do it in their living room. They can sit on the toilet and pretend it's a plane and stuff. There's people doing that online, which has been quite funny. I think more money and cheaper stuff doesn't really create for happiness. One of the things this book was talking about was just the, the value of security, just knowing that you've got a job. I, I don't like people to feel insecure. You know, when we had this crisis a couple of months back and, and it was... It was really painful to have to let certain people go. I, I hate, hate, hate doing that more than anything. It just upsets me. It's it's upsetting for them, but it's also upsetting for everybody who's here. I, I, I would love people to feel secure in their jobs, to feel that if they're looking after their job well, they're going to have a job for life. And that's old-fashioned, but people do tend to stay here for a long time. Yeah, I know. I think there's always. I know we, me, and you hear the sentiment a lot. Oh, some tape, some franchisors, or some people will say, "Oh, it's a national revolving door," but it's definitely not the case. And it really annoys me when I hear that because it's not true. There's multiple people here who've been here for many years now in various areas. The roles that they were referring to were just a couple of specific roles. Divisional support yeah. is a very difficult role to fill, and that's been the worst one. They definitely be revolving door at that senior level, mm. but that should affect our. Our middle level and junior staff are astonishingly stable. We, we don't lose a lot of people at all. As the business has grown, I mean, obviously a lot of new people come in because we're growing so fast. But at the same time, you know, people stay for a long, long, long time. I can name multiple areas. I know finance is a big one, which is a lot of stability. Mm. Um, insurance with Yadrin has been here for years. You have IT development. There's a lot of people in there. You had Bev and the girls in the office in Doc's team and compliance who've been there for years as well. Well, we've still got our first, first ever IT employee still working for us, Stuart. Yes, that's very yeah, Stuart, exactly right. And the dev team, you got and you got Eugene and the boys in um, IT support have been here for years Eugene's as well. Eugene's been must have been at least ten years. Been here for years. You got still I don't think a lot of people. We hardly lost anybody from IT. Yeah, which and that's, is, which that's is wonderful. And you're right, and that's why when I hear that comment, I get really annoyed because it's it's not the case, and this is the thing. But it's, it's the ones it's they, a couple it's of roles. The, it's the ones they see. Well, it's the ones that they, they hear from all the they see. There's only yeah. three or four roles, and that's really and it. that's and that's the hard part. And yeah. there is that sense, but but overall, we are we are very very stable in terms of employment. We really don't lose a lot of people. And if we have somebody, what we often do it too is if somebody is not working in a particular role, we'll try and we'll try and move them somewhere else. Mm. We'll move them and move them and move them because we're trying to find somewhere where they fit. And it's quite interesting. Somebody who doesn't work in one role can actually be very good in a completely different role. And I was going to say, even even uh, Jill and the call center, they have many staff who've been there for ten years plus, and they have like I think it's a plaque or something on their on their wall they have with their names, which is unheard of for most call centers. I, was... I love the idea of employment for life. I don't think people should be bound to it, but I think it's it's a great concept. If <laughs> mm. you feel that, look, I would like to think, and I think generally people working here have a sense of mission because we are very focused on our franchisees. Um, we hear we, we support thousands of families, and and that's the and a lot of people depend on what we do. And I think most of my staff actually do believe in that and they understand it, and they know they're doing something worthwhile. You've got to have a care factor here. And if you don't have a care factor here, you get found out very quickly. And that's that's the people we don't want here. It's very simple. You know, mm. we hopefully don't make those hiring mistakes. But you've got to have a care factor. If you don't care about the company and your you know and what you do, I find that's a very striking no thing too. I, I hear some very cynical things about staff, but I think most staff at gyms really do care about what they do and they, they care about their job and they care about the people we serve. But it wouldn't be to 9 o'clock at night sometimes. You know, I was here at 9 o'clock last night because I wanted to get something done for the website you know, and that's what you've got to do yeah. because I like it. It's not because I don't, because I have to do it. I like doing it as well. And I think you've got to enjoy it. What you said, you've got to enjoy it as well. Well, you've got an element of trust too because you, yeah. you, you can have an you know, appointment with the doctor or something and you come Absolutely. in late and we don't mind. I mean, and, and people can work very flexible. There's no formal flex time and stuff. But if somebody's doing their job when they actually do it, nobody time clocks around this place. No, they don't. It's not in a traditional sense, but uh, it's. It, but you probably find people work longer 
and harder with that than than your traditional, let's people, say, nine to five. People work a lot more effectively because they want to do it, because they mm. believe in what they're doing, than because somebody's watching them and saying, "Hey, you got to turn up." Correct. So we'll leave it there. Thanks for that, Jim. I know we just said we didn't have much to say, but there's a bit there, so we can package it up. So we got Ask Jim tonight from seven o'clock as well on our Jim's Group Facebook page. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes um, and obviously on Spotify as well. If you've got any subjects you want Jim to talk about, just email Jim at Jim's.net as well. well. There's been some questions about either the rights in America and so forth too. So yeah, we missed. We did we discuss that one. Yeah, we'll leave that. We'll see how that develops over the couple of weeks. But yes, let's give that a crack. All right, thanks guys. We'll see you next week.